I love this building and I love it for its architecture. I love it because of its history, because of what it means to to the, the archdiocese, what it means his, in terms of the history of this community. It's, it has an historical importance, um, which is of interest not just to the Catholic community, I think, but to those who have a knowledge of and a love for Scottish history and the way it, it has developed. It is part of that history. It's part of Glasgow's uh, development as well. Locus Easte, this is God's house, and like every house, it needs care and attention. So on the 14th of August 2009, work began on what is possibly the most ambitious renovation project ever accomplished by the Catholic Church in Scotland. Four and a half million pounds were spent, more than 3,000 books of gold leaf used, a baptismal font carved from a single four-ton block of marble, and a priceless painting of the martyrdom of St. John Ogilvie. The Cathedral on Clyde Street now draws the faithful and the curious from all over the world. Absolutely breathtaking. I was here on the Monday and it's just so beautiful and so peaceful and I've been every day since for one o'clock mass. It's really beautiful. The workmanship is just, and the glass, the stained glass being all cleaned it's just absolutely beautiful. Very moving and simple but nice. It's completely brand new, completely brand new and I, I like the way everything is. Ah, it's, it's really, it's really wonderful. It's very much lighter and brighter and particularly uplifting. It really is. It's gorgeous and it was so nice to see so many people there at the Mass at lunchtime. It's just wonderful. Very, very impressed. It's absolutely fantastic, yeah. yeah. What in particular struck you about it? The light, it's very open and very full of light. Um, before it was quite dark, but it's, it's still the cathedral, but it's just light and so open. But to understand the awe-inspiring scale of today's achievement, we need to go back two centuries to 1797. And what to our eyes today looks like a hovel in Carlton, the first permanent Catholic place of worship in Glasgow since the Reformation. It was located within walking distance of private premises previously used for the celebration of Mass. These included the house of Donald MacDonald, a comb maker in Bell's Wind, now Bell Street, and the pottery and house of Robert Bagnall in Turin Street. Both attacked in riots in 1778 and 1779. By 1785, Mass was being celebrated in the house of the Mrs. Fletcher of Dunnans, a convert family from Argyll. Their dwelling was in the property known as Montrose's Lodging in the Drygate, where it met the High Street. In 1789, Bishop Geddes leased from his friend John Wilson, the town clerk, a house in Blackstock's land in Salt Market, directly opposite the bridge gate known as the Brigate. Supported by manufacturers in Glasgow, a large hall in Mitchell Street at the west end of Argyll Street was rented in 1792 from the Duke of Hamilton and the Provost for the publicly avowed purpose of being a Catholic chapel. In the same year, the Reverend Alexander MacDonnell was appointed as Glasgow's first resident priest since the Reformation. Unlike these earlier private and rented premises, the Carlton Chapel of 1797, built when Reverend John Farquharson was priest in charge of Glasgow, was owned for the use and benefit of the Catholic community. It could hold 600 people, but it soon became too small. Situated to the west of the town's hospital, Scott's son and Laurie's woodyard in Great Clyde Street was bought and the building of a larger church began in 1814. Well, St Andrews was originally built as a chapel for the Catholic community in Glasgow, which at the beginning of the 
19th century was increasing in numbers. Um, it was built, called a chapel, and served that community in the way a parish church serves a community. Uh, it became a cathedral when the Archdiocese of Glasgow was re-established. That's the diocese in communion with the Apostolic See. Um, and a diocese always has a mother church, or a church which is the seat of its bishop or its archbishop. He has there his cathedra, his seat, his seat of office, his seat from which he teaches the faithful and so on, at which he presides at services. And so the church which contains his cathedra has the title of the cathedral. So this became a cathedral, wasn't built as a cathedral, though possibly Andrew Scott, who commissioned it, was looking to the future and thinking that someday we will need a cathedral, therefore let's build a church worthy of that need. It's extraordinary that Andrew Scott should have chosen one of the best architects of the day, James Gillespie Graham, to design the cathedral. The original scheme to include also a seminary was never a financial possibility. To buy the land and build the chapel was itself an enormous, almost impossible undertaking. Even though vandals did what they could to delay construction, the opening mass in St Andrew's Chapel in Clyde Street was celebrated on Sunday, 22nd of December, 1816. The Glasgow Herald of the following day commented, Divine service was performed yesterday for the first time in that elegant structure, the Roman Catholic Chapel, Clyde Street. The Reverend Mr Scott officiated. The chapel was crowded and the whole was conducted with the greatest decorum and propriety. Improvement in the religious situation in Scotland meant that in 1878 the Archdiocese of Glasgow was restored along with other dioceses of the Scottish Church. Recorded in the stained glass windows at the rear of the sanctuary on the east side are the coats of arms of the first four post-Reformation Archbishops of Glasgow. Charles Eyre in the late 1800s, John A. Maguire until 1920, Archbishop Donald Mackintosh until 1943 and Archbishop Donald A. Campbell until 1963. It's easy to imagine that all that vanished as the interior of the cathedral was effectively ripped apart in August 2009. Temporarily, God watched over but was no longer resident on the premises. For many years, people have been aware that St Andrews was needing a good makeover and, you know, the usual things like painting, lighting and so on, and the general maintenance that has to be upgraded. But um, in my seven years here, it's also been made clear to me by those who keep an eye on buildings and their development, that there, there were some major things to look at as well in terms of stonework. And given that there was an opportunity to really empty the place and strip the place down, it was also a chance to install underfloor heating, to look at new seating, um, and to think of some ways of making the place easier to use for the public, for the congregations to come here. As time has gone on, I've become aware just how much had to be invested, if you like, in the fabric of the building itself. And so the external envelope, the, 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 the work on the roof, the repointing, the replacing of stones, all that has been an enormous task even before we could, as it were, get into the heart of the building and renew the flooring, the lighting, improve the seating and all of that. I agree, it has been more massive than expected and I'm happily surprised that we've been able to do it within the constraints of, of the um, budget that we had for it. It always has been a building that people have admired, but it's now a building that people can rediscover and enjoy in, in a new way. One surprise for me was to look at precisely this door that has been opened up because that would have been originally the exterior wall and it's quite a thickness that they've had to penetrate to, to expand the door, to extend it, because this will be a rather splendid solemn entrance from the sacristy into the cathedral.
At times, it must have seemed as if the power and the glory was being bulldozed away, but through the rubble and the dust, human toil began to carve a new vision of a timeless story. The block came in from Italy as a four-ton, one solid block of uh, marble from a place called Cave Michelangelo. Now, Cave Michelangelo is the main quarry that Michelangelo used, and uh, it's known to have the best marble on the planet. The type of marble is called statuario. Uh, it's the same marble that uh, Canova's Three Graces was made of. So I wanted the very, very best marble that was possible to get. Christ, obviously, is the central character, and he's portrayed as the only figure in the frieze standing by himself. And this is, I think, partly inspired by the idea that immediately after this, he was then going to go to the desert for his temptations. He's not depicted with a halo, uh, but he is depicted with the dove beginning to descend on him. And then next to Jesus, uh, I've placed symbolically um, uh, the shepherds. People I've, I've, tried to, I've tried to depict people coming down to, ba to be baptised by the objects that they carry. So there's all these little kind of stories that are there to be looked for in the frieze, and I think, I think it'll be a fantastic teaching tool. Beyond the frieze, there is the lettering. I've, what I've done is I've, I've tried to make it a bit like a, the kind of lettering you would get in an old-fashioned manuscript, a, a, a medieval manuscript. Where the, where, the word, where the words are almost confluent, they're all running together, so that you have to read it very closely, because I really believe that if you read the lettering cl closely, you'll remember it more. And at the entrance, visitors find at their feet Bethlehem, in the form of the mosaic made at Christ's birthplace of the modern archdiocesan coat of arms. The message in the mosaic, I think, is that as people come in, they're immediately faced with something that tells them, gives them the identity of the place they're entering. And it is a cathedral church. It is a church which immediately, from what you see with the crossed keys on its uh, shield, is reminding us of the words of our Lord to Peter, which words about, I uh, will give the keys of the kingdom of heaven, uh, so much associated with the papacy that given that this church of Glasgow was called the special daughter of the Roman church seemed appropriate to, to create both in terms of the coat of arms for the archdiocese which was awarded to us by the Lord Lion, King of Arms, but also in reproducing it in mosaic in the very threshold of the cathedral. For art framer Mark Greer, the framing of Peterhausen's shockingly dark portrait of the martyrdom of St John Ogilvy was the most testing and satisfying challenge. The church in Glasgow were given a unique opportunity to commission a new altarpiece and they, they grasped it with both hands. The, they got a world-renowned artist, uh, certainly the best-known painter in Scotland, and they, they gave him the opportunity to create this, uh, this masterpiece, if you want. It's huge in size and the... It, it genuinely looks absolutely stunning. The, it's a typical housing. Um, it's unmistakably housing, and uh, is a, an incredibly bold, bold painting and a bold decision by the the, the church to offer this this job to him. The main difficulties are the, the first thing was the logistics of actually making a frame like that, um, with the art shape on it, the size of it. Um, there were a number of problems that we, we had to overcome and you know, we've got a great team in here so the various guys working specifically on how to get the arts right, how to join it together. Even then once we joined it together it's a massive job. It take, took up a whole studio to actually get this, get the thing gessoed and painted up and then gilded. Um, it was a ma major operation. Well, one of the problems is it was very top heavy because uh, the arch at the top is made of MDF which is much heavier than the base and when the, the arched canvas went in at the top that was heavier as well.
the foot. When the whole thing went up, the weight was very much at the top and we were very much at the bottom. The foot was quite, quite difficult and quite, uh, and it took a bit of heavy lifting. Just very relieved it went up in one piece. It was, uh, it was a major bit of uh, lifting by all the guys who were working in here and just uh, very, very pleased to see it up there because that's several months work and uh, I didn't want anything happening to it. So the guys did well. Just amazing. I, I can't describe the feeling. It's, um, it's like a vision come to fruition and it's very, very exciting to see it hanging. And it is a massive piece, but it's it's just it's perfectly positioned now, and it actually looks just right, you know, and the... the... Yeah, it looks okay. <laughs> I suppose hanging is brutal, and you can't get away from the fact, but people, you know, have to understand that John Ogilvy was hung, and this is the way that he's... He's portrayed, you know, as being hung, or just about to be hung, you know, so the, it's a brutal, brutal subject matter, but there's also a great sense of hope and redemption and, uh, and the glory, really, in the whole thing, and the, the glory of martyrdom, really, you know. It's the moodiness of it, I suppose, really. You know, there's no, there's no, no bright Mediterranean blues in it, you know. We're, we're in Glasgow, after all, you know, the rainy, rain and cloud and grey, but it's, you know... That's the, way, that's the way it is. So it does fit in with Glasgow. If life is meaningless, then, then John Ogilvy died in a meaningless, hopeless way. But I believe through faith that that's not the case. We've created a garden, an open area of a courtyard, um, a cloister, a sort of halfway between, if you like, the, the street, the road, the marketplace, and the interior, the, the sanctuary of, of, of the church. And I hope that those who are hesitant about entering a sacred building because, well, they're not Christians perhaps, or if they are, they, they're not very familiar with going to church, will find that going into that courtyard, they will feel it easy to make the next step and to enter the building. And that's what I hope they will do. Because in the heart of the city today, we need a place, an oasis of peace, of quiet, of prayer, of opportunity for people just to move out of the rush and bustle of life into a holy place, a place where they can discover themselves and their relationship to God and indeed to the community. The church is ever young, is ever being renewed. Here we are in a building which is renovated. It's a time for us to remember that the apostles spoke about us being living stones of a temple in which the Holy Spirit lives. And it's a message I hope that I'll be able to communicate on the day of the rededication, but it's surely a message that I'm sure that parish priests will also endeavor to, to bring to attention to the people when they say, come and visit the cathedral. It's our church, it's the center of our diocese, it's the seat of our bishop, and see in its renovation an encouragement for us to recognize our place as a community of faith and to renovate ourselves, if you like, as the, as the liturgy of the church suggests.